We will get started uh, for folks. Uh, love to see all the familiar names on here uh, that have been attending our webinars. And if you're new, welcome. Uh, so the people we have online here today. Uh, so myself, uh, founder CEO of Pringer Solutions Group, joined by the brightest minds at the firm. We've got Stacey Cope, who's director of all of our automation services. We've got world famous Razor's Edge consultant, Austin Brown, uh, who is our database consultant and an automation engineer. Uh, we're going to be talking through our favorite topic in the world, uh, everything about automation. Specifically, our examples will have to do with Razor's Edge. Most of our clients on the consulting side use Razor's Edge, but we're going to show some of the amazing things that you can do uh, with automation. Some housekeeping items. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes, this is being recorded. Um, we will send you the recording after the presentation. If you registered uh, under your email, you'll get an email from us probably no later than the end of today. If you don't see it, check your spam folder. But we'll always, after these webinars, uh, you know if you've been sending these for a while, we'll always post the recording. We'll always share the slides and give you a way to go back uh, and review. If you have questions as we go, and you should have questions as we go, because we always move fast, um, hit the Q&A button on your screen. So the chat where you told us where you're from is great. But if you put a question in the chat, we always lose track of it. If you hit it in the, put it in the Q&A button, that actually alerts us and it pops up on our screen so we can make sure to flag it, and make sure that we get your questions answered. So uh, please do use that. And a lot of times midway through the presentation, if somebody asks a question that's relevant, we'll just go ahead and, and answer it right there. Um, background on us, on, on who we are, if you've never attended. Uh, Pringer Solutions Group uh, is our company. We uh, have amazing people uh, working here, primarily in the United States. We've worked for amazing organizations all over the country. We provide fundraising consulting. We do annual field management in our niche, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we also provide Razor's Edge database administration. So there's a whole lot of organizations that are that are large that just outsource their database administration to us. And we've really got into fundraising automation. Uh, so we're about two years in now, and we're excited to share some of what we've learned. Um, we also have a pretty useful product called Ask Genius. Andrew Mankey here. Uh, is director of Ask Genius for us and is our vice president. What Ask Genius does is uh, pretty great. It sets personalized ask amounts. So long story short, we run a consulting firm. Clients pay us a ton of money to help them raise a lot of money and run these large five, ten, twenty million dollar annual appeals. When doing that, we wanted to find a way to set the perfect ask amount for everybody uh, in every household. Because if you just send out something one size fits all, you're not going to raise as much money. Andrew, do you know the reason I know that to be true? Yeah, well, you're showing it right here in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> just the article. How it, was a, this time? it was a big validating weekend for us. So actually, we've been working on for years. Uh, we've got hundreds of clients that use it to set ask amounts. And then this weekend, the Wall Street Journal ran this article. Uh, and it said, oh, my gosh, there's a simple way to get people to donate more money to charity. And lo and behold, it stumbled upon what we learned years ago, which is that when you present people with personalized custom ask strings, right, give them an array instead of just asking what might you give, you will raise more money. So that's all we're going to talk about today. We're actually not here to talk about Ask Genius, but if that does pique your interest, uh, we would love to have you sign up for a demo. Uh, we have two. We have one tomorrow, right, Andrew? Yep, tomorrow. Excellent. 11 a.m. Okay. Central. 11, 11 a.m. Central. Uh, so if you're in the Central Time Zone, it's a nice, reasonable hour. If you're in Australia or the Philippines, it is not. Uh, if you want to know more about it, go ahead and click the poll. We'll leave it up for 30 seconds, and then we'll move on to the topic of today. Um, but if you haven't yet, and I think I, well, I don't think, I know we have a lot of customers here who are on the webinar who are using Ask Genius. So thank you for being the early adopters. If you still want to find out more about how it works, uh, you can set up a demo or you can just answer the poll. Andrew uh, or one of us will follow up with you and get you all the answers you need. Uh, Andrew, who uses Ask Genius? What, what, what type of organization? All types of organizations. Um, we've got organizations that have 300 donors all the way up to 500,000 donors. So it doesn't matter what type of organization you are, you can use Ask Genius. Awesome. Okay. So with that, we'll continue on. And we, of course, we have webinars. We can share links. We've done all sorts of stuff on the topics of setting ask strings. That's not what we're here to talk about today. Today, we're talking about automation. And we're going to start at the beginning. How this all started, how did we, as a, a consulting firm, end up uh, spending so much time on automation? Well, it started with a client of ours. Uh, it was the Diocese of Phoenix, and the consulting practice that we have at Pringer Solutions Group is all for Catholic dioceses. That is our client base. So we there's 177 Catholic dioceses in the country. We run the annual appeal for most of them, or we serve as their outsourced database administration. 
So that's kind of the world that we work on the consulting side. And they're all kind enough to let us experiment on them while we are running their appeals, right? So we're helping them raise tens of millions of dollars. And every now and then we have crazy ideas. We want to test something out and they always say, sure. So in the Diocese of Phoenix, we ran a test uh, with our good friend, uh, Conde de Leon, where we thought, what if we built, worked on building a relationship with all of the donors by sending out more emails, personal heartfelt emails from a real person from Conde. But we, we didn't want to just do it. We wanted to test and see if it worked or not. So we took the database of the Diocese of Phoenix and we split it into two groups. Um, group A, and they're both alike, right? Group A was going to receive these, these emails from us on about every two or three week basis. Group B was not going to receive the emails from us, just like normal, right? So no harm done. We weren't taking anything away. We, didn't, we just weren't adding in this personalized email touch. And then we measured what happened. And I think we probably have a whole webinar on this topic, so I won't go into all of that. We can probably share a link with you. Um, the takeaway was this. Nonprofits should be emailing their donors a lot more often. And when we say that, we're talking about personal, heartfelt emails, not mass marketing, you know, every first Monday of the month e-newsletters, but personal, heartfelt emails from a real person, limited on photos or graphics. One might be okay. We always get into this. As soon as I say no photos or graphics, people take umbrage and they start writing in. So it's okay to have a little bit, but what I'm talking about is don't design it. Don't have a giant banner at the top. Don't have a huge unsubscribe link at the bottom. Don't load it up because that screams marketing and it probably won't even reach their email inbox today. Don't use hyperlinks, use raw, use the raw URLs, all these things that we learned. Eight to one nourishment ratio. And by, what I mean by eight to one nourishment ratio is for every email where you're asking for something, you need eight emails or social media touches or personal touches or phone calls where you're, you're giving something, where you're nourishing and building that relationship. What that looked like over the course of the year for this example was 30 emails that were all about email impact and appreciation or invitations to donate. And here's what we found out and why it led to automation. Those that remember the AB test that we ran, those folks who received the heartfelt emails from the development director over the course of a year were 62% more likely to give to the annual appeal. They were three times more likely to renew their gift that they'd given the previous year they gave gifts that were two and a half times larger. They were three times more likely to make a recurring gift on and on and on. They were more likely to donate online. All of the things that we measure and that we want, okay? So from this case study experiment where we learned, okay, email is really important. Clearly there's something here. We need to work with all of our clients to make sure we're building that connection and emailing as much as we possibly can. But it was still at this point a, a mass email, right? Yes, it was personalized and said, dear Stacy, dear Austin, you know, and it's from the development director, but we wanted it. We're always pushing the boundary. We thought, how do we take this to its natural conclusion, right? What if, if we know this works, what if we could write every donor individually? Okay, that's the thought that we had. What if it could be Sue is one of our donors and she gets an email from the development director saying, hey, happy birthday. Or Dan gets that personalized email says, hey, Dan, I just saw that your gift came in. That's amazing. That's awesome. You know, Rita, you've been given to us for 10 years. I don't know if you knew that, but I just noticed that this morning. You know, hey, Mark, thanks for fill, fulfilling your pledge. That's awesome. We really appreciate you. That would be sort of the, the, the best case scenario for any nonprofit that we're working with, if we could do that, if we could send those heartfelt messages from the right person as well, maybe not all from the development director, maybe from major gift officers or other people they're close with. So that's what we started thinking about. And immediately, we saw all the challenges, right? There's a number of reasons that that seemed impractical at the time. Uh, reasons why that would be impractical, we don't have the staff. Every nonprofit, I've yet to meet a nonprofit that is really overstaffed, you know, on the development side. Uh, we don't have the time to do that. Plus, think about the email that we, the example of, hey, Rita, you've been giving for 10 years. Like, you'd have to look up each donor one by one every morning to try and find out who's hitting those milestones or who just completed their pledges. There's a lot of work that goes in before you even get to the email. And the question a lot of our clients had, well, oh my gosh, Nick, what, what, if, what if they write back? I don't, I don't have time to deal with that. You know, they're all emailing me back. I just wanna, I want this to be a one-way relationship. Uh, and then of course, some, some logistical issues. You know, who is the right person to send the email? Because some of them are assigned to portfolio managers. We wanna make sure that people are emailing the people in their basket. So we put a pin in that. We thought, okay, maybe we're, the world's not ready for that. But at the same time, think of what we we're all experiencing. I'm going to use this one example from LinkedIn that I've used so many times. Uh, when we all log into LinkedIn, and I'm sure everybody on here has been on it, um, if you're on it a lot, then your boss is going to think that you're 
looking for a new job. That's a secret to LinkedIn. You can't be too active on LinkedIn or it starts to raise eyebrows. Uh, but when you're on LinkedIn, you open up and you get a little news feed like this. And this was for mine. I took a screenshot the other day. Uh, up at the top, it says, congratulate Gabe because he started a new job. He's got a new position, taking over as president of the USA Triathlon Foundation. Uh, and it says, say congrats. And what do I do? I take my, my bratwurst finger and I, I smash the screen and it says, hey, congratulations on the new role. Look what LinkedIn did for me. It wrote the dang message email for me. All I had to do was click send. I clicked on the button that it led me to to say congratulations. It wrote the message for me and then I just click send. Well, what we're here to tell you today is that you can now do the exact same thing with donor emails and so much more, right? It was just a matter of us really continuing to press on the issue. We saw this, this automation happening everywhere else in the world. We knew from our own studies and running nonprofit you know, annual appeals or fundraising campaigns that email works, and now we can marry the two together. And here's how and why. And I'll let Austin and Stacy talk a lot more than me in this next section here. You're here to, to listen to them, not listen to me drone on and on. So let's start. Stacy, I'm going to go to you first. Um, fundraising automation at, at its core, like what are the pieces? What is the software? Like what's happening? Why is this possible now? Tell us about what, what this looks like. So we primarily work with Razor's Edge. I imagine that many of you on the call are also Razor's Edge users. And a couple of years ago, they released a, an official connector to Microsoft Power Automate, which is one of the coolest tools ever. So basically the way Power Automate works is um, it can connect to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications for everything you can think of. So now we can go into Power Automate and we can access our data in the Razor's Edge and then we can connect it to all of these other things. We can use it to create Asana tasks or, you know, send emails or we can grab form data from Cognito and put that back into Razor's Edge. Um, so the whole world has opened up. So, so everything that used to be, to make sure I'm clear, everything that used to be inside of your silo, right? Razor's Edge was a silo, everything you had to get put into it. Power Automate is the connection to the outside world. Is that fair? That is fair, yeah. Okay, so based on things that happen inside of Razor's Edge, we can then say, if this happens in Razor's Edge, then do this using Power Automate to connect something else. If a donor makes their 10th gift, send an email. Awesome, yep. okay. So that's what it is. And here's where we've gone with it. And it's gone from like the rudimentary when we started in this all the way to some, some really amazing mind blowing stuff. Where we went with this once we got it set up and Stacy was, was the kind person on our team who said, when I remember when Blackwood first called and told us that they're were, they were gonna roll this out, we hung out from the call and we're like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be big. And then we're all like, oh, Stacy, we really need you to learn this. And Stacy's like, heck no, I don't want anything to do with this. Like, I, I don't, that's too much work. And like 48 hours later, Stacy's like, this is all I ever want to do with my life. Like I want <laughs> to automate my grocery shopping. Like this is, it's just so intoxicating once you get in. So where we went with it was this. Um, we quickly got to the point that for our clients that we're working with, um, I'm thinking of Bill in Kansas City. Bill's a good friend of ours, one of the first guys that helped, you know, was willing to, to leap into the automation. Bill arrives at his uh, nonprofit in Kansas City, and every morning he's got five drafts sitting there waiting for him. He clicks in there in his, when I say waiting for him, I mean they're in his Outlook. They're in a drafts folder inside of Outlook where he lives and works every day. He doesn't live inside of Razor's Edge as much as they want us to like spend every moment there. Like fundraisers and directors don't live inside of the system. He lives in Outlook. That's where work gets done. So he opens up his drafts folder, five emails. He clicks on a draft. If it's not a good fit and something doesn't look right, he just deletes it. If he knows the person, like in this case, he knows John, maybe he just saw him at a baseball game the night before. He personalizes it. Say, hey, John, great to see you at the baseball game. Tweaks it, the rest of it. Once it looks good, he sends it. He does this every morning. Five emails. Some of them might be for birthdays. Some of them might be for, you know, fulfilling a pledge. He says it is the greatest thing that has ever happened to him in fundraising. And he's been doing this for 30 years. Um, and, and that is not exaggeration because I've, I'm with him. This is also, I think, the biggest thing that we've seen in fundraising. So that's where the world is going. And we're going to share some more case studies here about how it works. Um, but I just want to celebrate this moment of what that means. I mean, all of us have been fundraising for so long. To be able to open up your laptop and have an email drafted for you sitting there on a platter, it just feels like the coolest thing ever. Okay? So where you can go with this, you can open up your email and have these drafts ready. It could be somebody that increased their gift. It could be somebody's birthday. 
Maybe somebody just made that milestone gift, right? Their 10th or 20th gift to the organization. Cybunt renewal. Stacey, we're going to talk about that with a client in Denver. Uh, maybe somebody just joined a new giving tier. They, they made a gift that put them into the president's circle at your university. That's something that would be tedious for you to go through and find out on your own and, and create some sort of an action. But you can automate it. Anyone that makes a gift above this level, draft this email that says, welcome to the president's tier. Okay? Maybe it's a first-time donor and you want to enroll them in a first-time donor workflow, a series of emails. Okay, so that's the big idea, right? That's where we're going with this. Reminder, if you have questions, hit the Q&A button as we go. Now we're gonna show you some live examples of how this works in the wild. And they are all going to be examples from our real life clients, right? Uh, who use Razor's Edge and our large Catholic diocese, you know, running uh, multi-million dollar appeals. Uh, Stacy, I, I like this example. What, is, what does it feel like to build these automation flows? <laughs> Okay, so this is the best GIF ever, or GIF, I guess we can have that discussion too. Um, so basically what we're doing with automation is we're telling the computer to do our work for us, right? So some of the things that a human does have, some of some of the things that humans do have many, many steps that you don't realize you're doing, right? So if you're making a sandwich, you have to go find a plate and you have to know where those are. And then you have to know where the bread is and you have to know how to un you know how to untwist the twisty on the bread. And you have to get the peanut butter out and find a knife and all the things, right? So obviously this robot is having a hard time making this sandwich because it wasn't told properly how to get the peanut butter out of the jar, right? So that's what we're doing with automation is we're telling it how to find the peanut butter and where to put it so that we can make the right sandwich or email. So. And it takes a special kind of, would you agree? I'll just say, would you agree it takes a special kind of person uh, to build automation? It does. It's it's fun. It's definitely something that is accessible to most people, but it's not. It's really not for everyone. No, some people will be <laughs> very frustrated with trying to get that robot to not throw the peanut butter on the yeah. floor. If, you know? if you love making lists, if you love doing the step by step stuff, like this is for you. And this is the best day. This is the first day of the rest of your life, right? You're going to become an automation specialist. Your, yeah. your organization is going to love you and thank you. Um, but it's it's it is. It's nuanced and it's step by step. Uh, there's, there's something to love about that. Okay, so here's what we're gonna share. We're sharing case studies. These, again, um, we have nonprofits of all different kinds here on the call. A few hundred signed up today. Our examples are all Catholic diocese because that's what our consulting arm works with, right? As Genius works for everybody. Uh, the automation stuff we're doing works with everybody. But all of our examples are from our consulting clients because they're the ones we're working with day in, day out. And they're always eager for us to experiment on them because usually it means they're gonna raise more money and, and save some time. So first example, what we did in Wheeling, Charleston. Stacy, tell me about this. What did we do in Wheeling, Charleston? So I love this one, um, especially in the in the Catholic world, everyone really likes to send paper letters, right? So a lot of you may be far ahead of this and are already sending out email acknowledgements, but tax letters and thank yous that go out after gifts are something that everybody does. Um, and Wheel and Charleston wanted to save some money on postage by sending as many as possible by email. Um, so we were able to automate a couple of things that are awesome here. So basically when a gift comes in every week, um, we use Power Automate to go and find all of the new gifts. If a donor has an email address, then we'll create an email for them that says, you know, thank you for your gift of $200. It's fully tax deductible, yada, yada, yada. Um, and send that email off. If a donor does not have an email address, we will create a Word document and put a whole bunch of Word documents together in a file along with envelopes. And then at the end of that process, we'll send once a week an email to Kayla there at the diocese and she prints off the letters and sign them, stuff them in the mail. So, um, so yeah, what used to take hours and hours to find all the gifts, create all the letters, you know, do mail merges, all the things. Now, basically no one touches at all except to print the letters. And at, at least half of their of their acknowledgements are going out by email now, which obviously saves a ton on paper. So. And the emails that go out, those can be from a real person, right? Like, those, again, that's not like a do not reply at blah, blah, blah. That's right. It's coming from, from Outlook, from their executive director. So it, you know, has her name and her signature on it. And if you hit reply, it goes back to Chrissy. Awesome. So you get the emails, you wipe out half of the paper you're sending anyway, because you get a heartfelt email that goes out. But then even on the, the Word version, the ones that are left that don't have email, they're not going in and taking Excel. You know, you used to do some of the stuff in Razor's Edge and they got rid of the functionality. So 
but you're not taking a spreadsheet and then a letter template and then merging them together and doing them all like that's just happening right as as yep. gifts come in they're going and those letters are sitting in a, a sharepoint folder is that where they're yep. at that's right and then every friday somebody gets an email that says click here because all your letters are done that's right unbelievable now yeah. What if you wanted to route those letters? So what we have a lot of clients that say, well, gifts above $1,000 get a special signature from this person, gifts below that, could you also work that into the flow? Yep, definitely. Some of our clients have, you know, three or four different people signing letters. So that ends up being three or four different files and those can go to different, you know, these email notifications can go to different people. So they just go where they need to go. Awesome. This yeah. is this is really is the, the first day of the rest of your life, folks. Um, let, let's keep going. We got about eight or 10 of these case studies. Okay, so we did Wheel and Charleston. Let's do Portland. Um, what it, th this was a little bit of a spin on the same thing, right? Yeah, so this was more of a uh, like a personalized kind of heartfelt stewardship email, right? So rather than being a formal tax letter with gift information and you know address and all of that, this was more of a, hey Joe, I just saw your gift. You are the best. Thanks so much. You know, love right. Stacey. Um, so the cool thing that we did in Portland is that we um, we split the list up, right? So um, if somebody gave over, I think it was over $500, we would create a draft email for those. So those, instead of being sent automatically, would go into the drafts folder so that you could look at them and say, oh, yeah, I just saw her last week, or, oh, she's the sister of father so-and-so at my parish, you know, I want to say I just saw him, whatever. So you can customize those, give a little extra love to those higher level donors, and then the lower level donors um, send automatically so that you know, you're not, you're not doing hundreds of these a day, right? So that you just have a handful to deal with, so. Because that's, I imagine that's something we hear from my clients a lot, right? Like I don't have time to like review a hundred emails. So we can just set a threshold. So like, like in this example, I think below 500 bucks just automatically gets emailed out. It's in their sent items so they can see that they sent it out, but they don't have to mess with it. Anything above 500 bucks or a thousand or whatever, it it sits in their drafts folder, like the, the first bill example, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. And again, you can route it through different people. Like you can, if this per, what if somebody is assigned to a portfolio manager? Can you have the email come from them? Yep, we can do that too. So um, in that case, yeah, you would have however many, um, yeah, fundraisers that you have. We can make sure that the email comes from the person that's assigned to them in the database. <laughs> Think of what it used to be like as a major gift officer. Like if I'm watching this today, like I'm thinking, my so Creighton University, my alma mater, the finest school in the nation. Uh, the major, all the major gift officers there, they're like, you know, they've got their 200 people. They could come in every single day and like have a different personal note, you know, to another 10 donors based on, it's mind blowing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll digress if I don't keep this moving through the case. <laughs> um, what about, how can this raise you more money? Let's talk about the Denver example, just because mm -hmm. it's the most concrete, like dollars and cents. We know it can save time. We know it's super cool. What did we do in Denver and, and how did it raise so much money? So I love this example too. Um, so Denver wanted to send out emails to their Cybent and Libent donors. So they're people that have lapsed, have, you know, maybe not given for two or three or four years. Um, so what we did with them just kind of as an extra effort was sent this email out to them. Um, this wasn't an ask. It was just an email that said, you know, you were one of our, our loyal donors. I'd love to talk to you about what we're doing with the appeal um, and and please call me to schedule a time to get together or, you know, right. I'll take you out for coffee or whatever it is. Right. So then right. in the bottom of the email, there's a link to, you know, here's my get calendar. Ready. Yeah. And then a link to donate. And we found that so many people just clicked that that link and made a gift they said oh yeah that reminds me i i've been meaning to actually give to you guys and now that you're asking me for coffee i'll just get so here's here's my so journey. it's like a so it's a double magic it's it's automating the follow-up with live and side which if you don't know what that is that's like our uh, make sure that you only the insiders attend our webinars so live on <laughs> and, and, and side last year but not this year some year but not this year so previous donors who haven't given yet we automate the outreach to them and then we combine it with a a clever psychological tool, which is, hey, I'd love to meet with you sometime, which scares the heck out of them because they don't want to do that. So instead of that, they're like, oh, yeah, I haven't made my gift. And then they donate. Right. Yep. Awesome. And this is a raise over one hundred thousand dollars in a few months already. Like this yep. is a great example. There's so many cool things you can do with automation. This is the one that you can take back to your executive director and be like, look, man, like 
It's going to save me a ton of time. It's super fun. Our donors are going to love it. We're going to build all these long-term relationships, but it can also raise us real dollars and cents in the near term. Um, okay, let's go back to Phoenix for a minute. What do we do in Phoenix? I think this is a good example. Um, okay, so Phoenix, they have they have what they call relationship managers. Um, people call them major gift officers, portfolio managers. What they wanted to accomplish was they just wanted it's surprising how simple this sounds, but how hard it can be to do inside of Razor's Edge. They just wanted an alert, right? Hey, when a donor makes a gift of $5,000 or more, please tell, you know, Brenda or Martha, whoever it is, whoever is their relationship manager, please let them know, right? Shoot them an email, give them an alert. And I like using this example. This kind of shows, this is what a flow looks like, isn't it, Stacey? Like when we build them? Yep. Yeah, this is the the original draft of what all the decisions are that we're asking the computer to make as they look at each of these gifts. Yeah. Awesome. So the gifts comes in. Okay. Who's the engagement manager? Do they have one? Uh, if so, do X, Y, Z. And then the magic, because we get better. So when we started these, it's always fun to look back at the earliest automations, right? They're very mm -hmm. yeah. thick figurey and like we could see where we're going. <laughs> but then we get smarter and smarter and layer the stuff on. If the donor's unassigned, this was the magic in Phoenix, it kicks an email to the head person there that's like, hey, this person just made a gift. They really should be on somebody's radar. Like put them onto a, a somebody's portfolio. And if I'm at a university, this is that missing piece that's never there because the way universities work, you have major gift officers, maybe once a quarter, more likely once a year, you take a look at who's in the portfolio and you kind of reassess. This should be happening live. Anytime somebody raises their hand inside of your system to make a gift of a certain capacity, you should be assigning them right away you can do that. You can even auto assign them, honestly. It doesn't need to bring it up and have somebody pick. So there's all sorts of fun stuff you can go down that rabbit hole with. Uh, one of our last two examples, that we're gonna get to all the questions. I see we got a ton of really good questions in here. So please keep those coming in. Let's talk about data hygiene uh, and third-party sources. Austin, I'm gonna go to you on this. So in Baltimore, again, unique to our consulting practice, which is Catholic Diocese who have this issue of the diocese might be on Razor's Edge. All of the parishes which feed up into the diocese might be on Excel or ministry platform or some other program. And they're always constantly battling to get those things connected. Um, we built something cool. We say we as if I have anything to do with this, right? Uh, Austin and Stacy built something really cool that the rest of us just generally understand um, where you can take data from third party sources. So this is about deceased records. Stacy, I'll start with you, then I'll go to Austin. What is this on the deceased records we're looking at here? So, so the Diocese of Baltimore, Archdiocese of Baltimore has a uh, parish platform that has all of the parish data, and then it has the diocesan platform, which is the Razor's Edge, where they keep all the diocesan data. And the parishes are keeping records over here in ministry platform. And the idea is that people think that once the church knows about something that the whole church knows about it right but really we have many many data silos because that's how the world works so so the idea in baltimore was to get the data from the parishes into the razor's edge at the at the archdiocese so um this is an example of a of a flow that finds records marked deceased in ministry platform and basically then goes to look them up in razor's edge sees if we have a record um this um what basically happens in this flow is that it puts a card uh, this little pretty thing into a teams a teams uh channel so that you can open this up and you have your deceased people for the day you know i have five people that were marked deceased and here's a link to his obit here's a link to his record in razor's edge or at least what we think is his record in razor's edge yeah and then more in information from ministry platforms. So this basically allows a, a person to have all this information ready to go for them um, to make to make updates in the database. So so the use case here, again, sticking with the diocese, and I can already see you know, analogs at other organizations, but this is basically a, a database administrator has a Slack channel open or a Teams channel open. And anytime somebody is marked deceased in another data set, so not even in Razor Z, somebody's marked deceased over there, it pings him with a little message, a little card that's like, hey, this happened. And you can click to approve it and mark that person deceased in Razor's Edge, or you can do a little more digging. Is that? That is right. Yep. This is this is nuts. Um, awesome. <laughs> all of this, I'm just laughing at how painful all of this stuff was for years. And now this great revolution of, it, it requires, of course, Razor's Edge, you know, and, and automation. And it requires the other data source to have at least an, an API or something that we, you know, we can feed 
and make these cards. But Austin, what if they don't? What if they don't have an API? What if they're in those old days that many of us are still in of Excel, right? So the instance in our world, uh, lots of parishes are on some sort of a platform, and they want to send updates to the mothership, right? Which is on Razor's Edge. Um, you're stuck comparing two spreadsheets, right? Here's what the parish says they have for all their rosters. Here's what we say they have, and then you have to go through line by line. How would you use Power Automate to make that a little bit easier? So I've used Power Automate to build a flow that just looks up constituents in Razor's Edge and then applies a likelihood score as to where we think they are in a match. Is it a five, a hundred percent, this is a match, or is it a one? You need to take a look at it. Um, and then the out the outgoing result is it splits it into files on whether we think this is a new constituent, whether, you know, this is a high likelihood, this is a low likelihood, and it breaks it apart so that when you're then looking at the data, say from these parishes, you can immediately know what you're looking at and move forward with it as quickly as possible. This is, I like to call this the magic folder, um, because that's essentially for, for all of us uh, common folk that, that aren't deep in the weeds of Power Automate, that's how it works. It's a, it's a folder, you drag an Excel file into it, Austin's flow then rinses through it and it scrubs it and it sees who matches up inside of Razor's Edge. Because the issue here, right, Austin, is that that Excel file doesn't have a constituent ID on it. That's correct. So that's so it's not just in our world, you know, parish and diocese, but I mean, you built something like this at your old job, right? So this is something all nonprofits end up getting spreadsheets from time to time. Is that right? All of us have to deal with data coming in from somewhere else. So when that happens, use this crazy flow, drop that spreadsheet into the magic folder, and at least what you, you'll still have to do some manual work. We haven't gotten rid of humans completely, right? But you can at least start on, okay, here are the 20, five out of five, definitely the right person because of the name and the email matches. Let's just globally import those. And then you can work your way through a lot more efficiently than just going line by line. Hopefully you have an intern. You can give all the low ranking ones to the intern to look up by hand. Um, okay, keep the questions coming. I think we're on our last example here. Um, Cleveland, something similar, but we get asked. So Stacy, I'll go to you. So far, we've talked about all the stuff I love to talk about, which is raising money, right? How do we delight the donors? How do we email them? How do we like make our, you know, frontline fundraisers life easier? Um, we've talked a little bit about the back office stuff, but this is a really good example for that other, that back office side, the reporting and all the really glamorous side of fundraising. So what was it that Cleveland needed and, and what did we do there? So Cleveland has a program where they receive donations for their parish schools, and then those are all parceled out to, to each individual parish, but the money comes into a central location, and they needed a way to report out who the donors were to all of those satellite organizations, right? Um, and so they had a process that they were using where a person took days to take the whole massive list of gifts and split it up into 100 separate files and email them all out to separate people. Um, so it worked, right? It took Mark three days every single month to do it. Um, and so what we were able to do in Power Automate is basically have have that do most of that work, right? So, so it took the entire giant file um, of all the list of gifts, splits this, split it up into 100 separate files for each individual parish, um, and then sent out an email to each parish um, with the file attached um, so that they could have all of the data that they needed. So it basically now is at the push of a button instead of somebody spending three days on it. Is this the hardest thing that we've ever done? I think so, yeah. Yeah. One of those early on where we're like, gosh, we take this on. I don't know. You know, but then we're so committed. We're like, I guess we just got to solve <laughs> we have it. To do it. We have to figure it out. <laughs> so the old way, I, I love an example, because this talk about time savings, right? So the old way, you can imagine what a mess this was. One person's whole job, two or three days a month, is to create this report, right? Stacy spent some time on it, worked her tail off, and now has a button that that person clicks once a month. And it goes and gets it all, chops it all up, and emails it out to folks. Okay, um, we'll do a wrap up so we could talk about this, and we will <laughs> for days and days and days. I will send you the slides, but this is the slide that you'll want to to look through as you're brainstorming. So let's start with automation ideas, more stuff you can do to aid with data cleanup, right? So simple things. Give me an alert when somebody just created a dupe. 
right? Um, automatically fill in the blank preferred. Why is this a big deal, Stacey? What's the nickname thing here? Well, there are, especially in Razor's Edge, but in other databases also, there's um, there's tables and tools that you can use to create addresses and salutations and name formats are always going to be important. So, <laughs> Um, automatically filling in empty nicknames can make a big difference in saving you time when you're doing all of that and getting your names correct in the, you know, in whatever else you're automating. Got it. And the idea being you can just set this to go and run all the time, right? So it's just a constantly scrubbing. It's like a little house cleaner, right? It's just yeah. constantly going through your database house and cleaning things up. Yep, it's the kind of thing that back when I was doing database administration for nonprofits, I would every Friday I would run a query and I would find the twenty records that were missing these and I would fill them in myself, right? And now it's just done all the time. Awesome. Without ever touching it. Um, marking emails and phones as primary, validating new emails, right? Getting an alert when it's, hey, this email is spelled wrong and they spell Gmail IA instead of AI. Um, allowing non-privileged users to submit a record change. That's a little bit, we can get into the weeds on that. Uh, updating consent records. Marking records with a blank address as no valid address, which is a huge time saver. Um, helping with gift processing, stuff you can do, right? So automatically run donor acknowledgement letters. We shared an example of how that can work. Uh, providing email supplement to year-end tax letters. One of the worst days, now it's called the worst week in nonprofit world is always the first week in January, right? You're, you're, you're tired, you came off a of Christmas break, you just had New Year's, right? You just ate you know, a pot of chili on, on New Year's Day, you're at work and the phone just starts ringing because it's all of, I affectionately, like my grandpa's built this way. It's all the guys and gals calling saying, I wanna fill out my taxes, right? It's January 2nd, I want, how much did I donate? Give me that letter. And you're like, just wait on the dang filing you're gonna get, but, you, but it happens, right? So your phone's ringing off the hook and you gotta look everybody up. You can just create an automation and just email people. For those people that are really dying to do their taxes on January 2nd, here's an email. Here's all the gifts that you've made you know, to XYZ Charity. Um, bringing data in from an online census form. I think, Austin, you've done this a, a couple times too, even in your, your old job. So if it, whatever that form is out there, if it's a special event, if it's something, if it's a census form, create it, make it publicly accessible, and then you can use it to ingest the data into Razor's Edge. Um, We've talked about alerting on large gifts, just alerting staff. I'm shocked how much of the work we do, Stacy and Austin, is just making life easier. How many development directors have called and said, you know, Nick, Stacy, Austin, I want one thing. I want an email every day that tells me who made a gift the day before. Like that's all. I, if you if you give me that, you know, I can I can rule the world. Little things like that are such a breeze to do in automation in ways that may not be native, you know, in the system you're doing. Um, Tagging Giving Circle Society members, another nightmare scenario. You have an annual report to do, and you got to go through all of your data to find out who's really a part of the different societies and stuff. Just make that make those tags automatic and live, right? That's that's a huge time saver. Okay, so we're going to tell you how you can get started. Then we're going to tackle. We got 20 plus questions in here. We'll go through them all. How to get started? Lightning round, Stacy. What's the first thing you do? So you, you hear this, you're like, this sounds cool. Where do I go? Yep, so Microsoft nonprofit status, you probably already have it. Ask your IT. If you don't have IT, you probably still already have it. But if you don't, it's very easy to apply for, so definitely go do that. So that, that needs to be step one. Because that gives you the discounted rate for the licenses that you need, right? Yes. Um, so where do they, you, they need to be on Office 365. Yep, um, that makes your life easier. There are a couple of questions about Gmail. You can use Gmail for a lot of these things. So. So yes, if you're on Office 365, that will make most of these automations a lot easier, but it is possible if you're using G Suite. So keep that in mind. Um, and Power Automate license, um, this is this comes up a lot. There is, depending on the version of Office that you're on, you may already have a free version of Power Automate, which is amazing. And you can automate a bunch of cool stuff, but you cannot access the Razor's Edge through Power Automate with the free license. So you do have to buy a per user license, which it should be for you less than $4 a month. What about this scenario if you have like f emails coming out from five different people, like the emails come out from the assigned solicitor or something like that, do they need five licenses? Right, yeah, and you can do it, you can do it a couple of different ways. You could probably set them all up with one license, with one Power Automate license and have um, all your, um, all your users enter their credentials directly into the Power Automate flow because the permission for, for, um, 
for the email account is separate from the Power Automate license also. So you could run emails to or from multiple different people from inside one, one Power Automate license, but you could also do separate licenses for all of them too. So. Awesome. So if you're a big organization, you may still just be at four bucks. Uh, it's not necessarily tied to the number you're sending out. Okay. What's TechSoup? So TechSoup is the um, is basically the clearinghouse for for a lot of um, of technology products for nonprofits. So that's your your first stop once you have your Microsoft nonprofit status. That's where you'll buy all of this stuff and lots of other things. Awesome. And I'd never heard of that. So I, I learned a lot about TechSoup. Um, and then you can do, you can also do a free trial, right? If you just want to play around the flow.microsoft, is that where to go? Uh, I think so. I think it might be make.powerautomate.com too works. You'll, you can find it. Um, yeah. They try keep rebranding. That's how, that's how fresh and new this is. I know. So yeah, search for a Power Automate free trial. And I believe it, it used to be a month long free trial. So you could use all your Razor's Edge stuff and all the premium connectors that you want to give it a try and see how you like it before you commit. And you'll be shocked to see how many connectors are. So Razor's Edge has a connector. That's what we're working in. Clients have Razor's Edge as a connector to Power Automate. We connect the two and then we make all this wizardry happen. You'd be shocked what else is connected to Power Automate. The world is moving in this direction. Yep. Thousands of free templates, right, Austin? So you can go in, take a look at templates, mm -hmm. uh, little things, right? So the, the most fun is to start off, just do something for yourself, not even related to your organization, right? Just automate. Hey, if I get an email from my mother-in-law, right, send this reply, you know, and then text my wife. Like that's the sort of thing that you could set up right now inside of Power Automate. Okay, so where we're going for this, um, we're going to answer questions just to give you an idea of the webinars and things that were that's happening for us. Um, we've been working on this for the last two years, right? And, and our clients have been wonderful and let us use them as a laboratory for all these different experience experiments that we shared with you today. Now through July, uh, we are actually turning this into a service. And, and a lot of folks have been on a waiting list. There, I'll give you a link where you can join the waiting list. We are going to offer this as a service to folks who don't want to learn it themselves. Yes, you can go do, we will help you all day long and we'll continue giving free webinars and advice for folks who want to build it on their own. There's lots of nonprofits that are like, cool, Nick, I just want you to set up that email thing that you were talking about. So we didn't have a way to do that. We will come July. We're branding it as Automate Genius. It'll be a sister product of Ask Genius. Um, nice, affordable, one-stop shop for you to get some automation help. Uh, and then in July, we're launching it. So we'll have the menu up of the automations that we've built and what you can choose from. We'll make it super easy for you, standardized pricing, all that good stuff. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can go to automategenius.com. That's just a landing page. Come July, we'll have a whole website and everything fancy. You'll be super impressed by it. For now, we've got, I think, <laughs> couple paragraphs on like a link that says join the waiting list. So make sure to do that. Uh, I'm going to put the last poll today. If you want to learn more, um, you can let us know here. And then while that's running, I'm going to, I want to make sure we get to these questions. So I'm going to jump right in. Actually, Austin, did you see any questions we should start with? You've had a chance maybe while I've been talking here. Um, yeah, there is a lot of questions about like Gmail and G Suite. And so I do just want to reiterate that 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 is possible. Um, there is a connector to G Suite within Power Automate, so you're able to do different things that appear in the system you're used to seeing them in, if that makes sense. Um, so, so the answer to G Suite and Gmail, yes, it's possible. And we're, I mean, we're on the front end of all this. So our competency, because we just went where most of our clients are and people were, is Office 365, which I think was like 80% of nonprofits and Razor's Edge. Yes, there are other things you can do. Get in there and, and, and dig around or shoot us a note. We can let you know. A lot of the examples we use, though, are our Office 365, but it's still possible and doable. And that goes for other CRMs, too. That question is out there. Um, we, of course, yeah, primarily work with Razor's Edge, but other, other nonprofit CRMs do have connectors in Power Automate or in other other similar kind of low code applications like Zapier or those other things. So um, definitely worth looking around. If you're using something else, ask your ask your your database people um, what kind of options you have. And some of the some of the databases have automations built inside of them too. So don't forget to look inside of your product too for what you might be able to do. And if you would have tried a, a year ago to talk to your you know your CRM about this, they might have looked at you blankly. Now they don't. They I'm talking to them weekly. Everybody is getting connected because it makes their life easier, right? They don't need to roll out the new features as fast if they can connect to something like Power Automate and then you can build some of them on your own. So, um, okay, some quick questions here. Uh, 
hyper do the hyperlinks uh, on the, one of the emails that we sent. Stacy, did those link back to the constituent record? Is that what's happening? Yep. So those, whenever we do draft emails, um, we have a digest email that goes to the person sending the drafts that says you have emails for the following five people. Here's a link to the record in Razor's Edge. Here's a link to the gift we're talking about. Um, and we also, someone asked if you can add actions in Razor's Edge while we're doing this. Yes, the flow adds the action. We can even mark it complete for you if you want, if you don't think you're going to get to that part. So, but there's, in a lot of those digests, there's a link to that action record too, so that once you've updated or or customized your email, you can go click on that action record and go directly there and update it and click it and mark it complete. And, and one of the things I love about what Stacey and Austin do is like, they, we live in this world, right? So we are database administrators. Like we we know the ins and outs. I feel, this is kind of happening to Soapbox for a second. There's a lot of tech firms that we find that are like, hey, buy this whole new platform, buy this entire new solution and we'll like automate things. Like, and there's, it's just one more giant thing that you need to learn. That's not where we fit, right? We're plumbers. We're, we're like, you need to do a certain task, right? You need to, somebody deceased and you got to change the salutation to make it just be the, the spouse because the other person died. Here's a way to serve it up for you on a platter with a hyperlink that you can do it yourself and, and make it automated. That's where we live in. Yes, there's big, cool, fancy stuff that you can do. We're, we live to be practical, right? Here's how you can create the file. Here's how you can send emails. Here's how you can create actions. Um, a question from Tammy, uh, our friend up in Green Bay, could you do different files for different types of gifts? Like, so an example, somebody just made a gift, like an IRA gift to need different receiving language. Austin, is that something that we can do? Yeah, so you can have as many templates as you want for acknowledgement letters. You can build in conditionals into them. So say if it's a certain campaign, you want it to include the fund description instead of the campaign description. The bottom line with automation is, it is as customizable as you want it to be to match your organization's business processes. Yeah, well said. Uh, question from Jason. This is the question I had too. When if this was go back to like Wheeling Charleston example, when you send all those letters and envelopes to SharePoint to be printed, are they in one file or does someone need to like? Do you need to open up thirty different Word docs and print them? Stacy, how does that work? That's a great question. Yeah, we actually have end up having both, right? So we'll create each individual one. So if somebody calls you next week and says, can you send me my letter again? You can go get Austin's letter and send it to her. Or, But we will also put it all into one gigantic document. So you just have to open one and print one huge document. Love it. And, and that's what we've learned too. Like it's layers on layers of automation. It's like automate the email, then automate the word thing. And, and then, okay, automate taking 30 Word docs into one file so we can easily print it, but then save the others. Um, it's it's just bonkers once you get into it. Um, Austin, any questions? I'm scanning through here. I want to make sure anything that jumped out to you. Um, I can keep going here. Lots. Of, go ahead. One that says, uh, can you automate reports from database view and web view to send an email to fundraisers? And the answer is yes. It's a little bit harder to get data from database view, but it definitely helps if you have the Q module to help automate that sort of uh, export piece. Great. Uh, question from Rachel, how realistic is it for a small organization that might have the time and inclination with a small budget, right? Is the, the limited version that comes with 365 sufficient or do you need additional licenses? If you have 365, Rachel, your only outlay then is four bucks a month for Power Automate. Like if, you, if, you're in that, if you're in that situation where you've got the time and willingness to learn it, four bucks a month, I think is the Power Automate license, even at small nonprofits that's, you know, a, a very good investment of your your time and energy. Stacy, people ask a lot, you know, where I know we shared like flow.microsoft and stuff. Is it I know it's early in this and you can feel like are there trainings, are there resources? Like where can people go if they do want to learn more? Yep. So actually the place Austin and I both started to learn how to use Power Automate was with Blackbot itself. They have a small team of people there who kind of as a labor of love got into the low code thing and um, and did a, a training called the Accelerator. And those videos are all online on Blackboard's website. Um, we can find that link and send that out in your follow-up email link. I don't have it on me right now, but um, but there's you know a couple of several hours worth of training classes and a lot of really, really great information. There's a great community in uh, the Blackboard world um, full of people that are kind of you know doing this because they want to save themselves time or figure something new out. So, um, so that's, I think, a great place to start if you're a Razor's Edge user. Otherwise, Microsoft also has trainings in their community, um, and there's tons and tons on YouTube. So, All right. 
love it. How how hard is it? So this is a good question. I just saw Samantha ask it. Like, be realistic. Like, somebody with no coding experience, like, what does this give us? What does this look like? I had no coding experience when I started with Power Automate. I was a Razor's Edge user, so I was, you know, a user of the the GUI. Like, I was not a real database person. I was just somebody that really knew how to use Razor's Edge, right? So. Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely possible for for any of you. Um, again, you know, advanced logic skills are going to be helpful, um, and liking to make lists and flowcharts and those kinds of things is something that, you know, if those kinds of things make you <laughs> start to itch, like you're not going to like it. But right. but yeah, no, it's definitely um, fairly fairly significant learning curve, but it's definitely something that anyone could do given enough time. Um, yeah. I like two quite oh, I'm sorry, Austin, go ahead. Oh, I was also going to add, I also don't have experience with coding. Um, I only knew some HTML back when I had to figure out how to update a website, like it, like, but not enough to invent it on my own, if that would make sense. Um, and I would really say, if you want to learn this yourself, you're going to have to put time into yeah. it. So there's going to be a cost, right? And that's going to be the time to learn how to do this correctly. Right. And uh, the classes that Stacy and I took to learn how to do this, it, it took me like 35 hours over seven weeks plus practice and homework and training and that sort of thing. So yeah, it, it will take a bit of effort on your part if you want to do this yourself. Well said. And I think that's that's an honest answer because Stacy and Austin are both world-class razor judge people. I mean, truly, like they know it inside and out. They started from that basis and then learned the automation stuff. So if you're not even comfortable yet in your CRM, you're probably not going to love this because right you need knowledge of one or the other so it's very doable it takes a little bit of shoulder uh putting shoulder to the grindstone uh spencer asked a question and then emmett answered kind of asked kind of a, a similar one stacy i'll ask you what about error stuff like so let, let's start the first way like you do something cool when we build automations like to let what do you do so that you know if something's not running right yeah, so we build a lot of kind of error handling things into flows. So one example is if we're sending out an email and the email shows up as invalid, it will give you an error. And you could either, you know, choose to ignore that or what we usually do is we'll build something into the flow that will basically just send an email to someone that says, you know, we tried to send an email to Joe Smith, but his email was invalid. Please go look at it. And then you go look at it and it says Gmail and you fix it and then it goes out the next day, right? Um, but there's bunches of stuff like that. And really depending on the cleanliness of your data, you're gonna find all sorts of crazy things as you get into trying to automate stuff. So I think, um, you know, data hygiene is, is something that we run into that causes trouble, um, but we are able to, in most cases, put something into the flow to catch kind of weird one-off errors to, to alert somebody to correct it. Yep, love it. Uh, what I think Spencer's question was, what have we learned? Have we screwed? Did anything not work as attended? Like <laughs> such a loaded question. I mean, like everything when you start, but like any good examples of stuff that we learned lessons on? Um, we sent out birthday emails uh, for a client and we were using kind of a birthday or a, a age append data and it had all of the birthdays on the first of the month. Um, and so, you know, those ones, <laughs> when we sent those out, Got a lot of responses back that said, thanks, but my birthday is in like three weeks, weirdo. You know, <laughs> so, you know, there's all sorts of weird stuff like that that happens. Um, oh, what else? That's I would weird. also say that we're not like just building things and publishing them. Like there's mm -hmm. an extensive test process that goes, that we go through with our like sandbox database. So we're not using live real data when we first build things. And we're also going in stages. So we're trying to get the foundation down and then we build and evolve it from there. So we're not just going guns blazing. We're gonna run down a soccer field and score a goal. We're gonna dribble a little bit around our, our end first. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, what about, so question from Nicole about Outlook send limits. We get this from IT a lot. So usually what happens is development office hears about this. They call us, they're so excited to roll stuff out. They loop in IT and IT is like, whoa, 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 there's a million, you know, like, let's let's get serious about this because rightly so, you don't want to just start blasting stuff out. So what do we know about Outlook sender quota, stuff like that? Yeah, so definitely we are not using any of this automation for any kind of massive email sends at all. That would be a terrible idea. 
Please yeah. do not do that. Um, so what we're talking about is fewer than a couple hundred emails per day from an individual sender. Um, so that's what we're looking at. They're kind of more personalized, more targeted. We're not doing any kind of big, you know, big thing. Because yes, th that's going to cause you trouble and get you, you know, cause you trouble with your, your limits. Um, oh, what else was I going to say about that? Oh, the other thing about that is that um, the way most of our Power Automate flows are set up, um, if it's automatically sending out emails, it's going back to Razor's Edge in between each one. So it's not even sending all, you know, say we're sending 50 emails a day or something. It's not sending all 50 at once. It's going to take it three or four minutes to send the 50 emails, right? So it's it. I, we haven't had any trouble with anything flagging because our volumes are low and because we're not doing it all at once. So. Yep. It, it's yeah don't use this you know use it properly for use a tool for its right purpose this is not a replacement for constant contact or bulk email or sending tens of thousands like that's not what this is this is for those flows related to email high touch personalization you can reference them by the right name and note that they just made a get, fulfill their pledge the night before like and you can serve it up on a platter so that it's a real person so that austin can open up her computer and review it and send it like that's the best in our experience the best use case for the email or function, right? It's this is not bulk email. Yes. Yeah, it's basically what you would do if you had the time to write emails to yeah. the 10 donors that you wanted to today. We're just going to do most of it for you. Yes. And if you had an army that spent the night at the nonprofit going through the data and giving you post-it notes like, hey, Bill made his 10th gift. Mark just paid off a pledge like that. And then they wrote the email for you. Yeah. OK, um, one or two more. We're coming up on the end of time. Um, is there a way to make a flow for pledge payment reminders? Yes. That's a good question. Short answer, yes. get all data from database view though. So you'll have to, so if you don't have Q and you want to do this, I'm always apprehensive to automate things. And then there's pieces in it that you still have to do manually. That just feels a little icky to me. So if this is something you want to do, I recommend taking a look at Q um, if you don't already have it as a part of your contract. Last two questions. Uh, the last one goes to Candace, but before we get that, uh, Peter asked about, uh, I've noticed limited RE fields available. Uh, what's your perspective on the speed at which BlackBot is making fields available to Power Automate? Do we have a perspective on that, folks? Yeah, um, they are definitely working on things. They Since we started working in automation a couple of years ago, they've added a zillion fields and things are getting added all the time. So yes, there are still things missing that would make our lives easier. Um, but it is, it, I mean, as, as far as we can tell, it's being worked on all the time. So getting better they've, all the time. They've shown a good commitment to that. So Blackboard deserves some lumps in certain areas. This is an area where they've been pretty earnest about getting people what they need because I think they rightly see where the future is. Last question, are Austin and Stacy's sisters or just from the same geographical area? Their vocal inflections are similar. Austin, Stacy, uh, where are you from? And is it because you're related or is it just this is what brilliant Razor's Edge people sound like? That is it, yes. Yeah. I'm, from, I'm from Nebraska. Austin? Uh, I'm, I'm in North Carolina. Currently. So could not be further apart. The Great evil. Plains of Nebraska and uh, over in North Carolina. We so. just talk about this stuff a lot. So <laughs> yeah, we talk every day. I feel like we're rubbing off on each other. That's yeah. right. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up there. We will send you uh, an email. It'll come from Andrew Menke um, at Ask Genius. It'll have a link to the webinar. It'll have a link where you can download the slides. Uh, any other resources that we want to put in there, we will put in there. You've got all of our information, so please feel free shoot us an email. Uh, if you filled out a poll or if you went to the website and got on the waiting list, you will learn when we launch this whole automation thing in July. In the meantime, final plug, if you haven't tried out Ask Genius yet, go check it out. You're going to raise more money. You're going to save time. You're going to love it. Um, and then anything left for you to do, you can just create a Power Automate flow and eventually your job will be great. Um, okay. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you and uh, we'll catch you on the next webinar. Thanks, everybody.